It's been exactly three years since we took over the responsibility of caring for the 250 tortoises once kept and cared for by the Wildlife Conservation Society on St. Catherine's Island. Our breeding facility has expanded and improved since that time, as have the number of the species we are now working with. We currently manage over 25 taxa and have bred over 17 different species. Our incubation protocol for each species has improved by understanding their specific needs. Diapause, temperature and humidity variations, and choice of substrates, along with other considerations. We have successfully reproduced Homopus signatus, Geoclemis hamiltoni, Giacelloni elegans, Manuria impressa, Chesina angulata, Giacelloni platinota, Astrochellis radiata, Malacochesis tornieri, Manoria hemispherae, Pyxis planicauda, Kinixis erosa, Indotestudo faustini, all three subspecies of Pyxis arachnoides, and Rhinoclemis rubida rubida. This past year we added a new greenhouse specifically designed for the needs of the flat-tailed tortoise from Madagascar with automated sprinkler, humidity and heating system. This has notably improved our breeding success with this species, with five hatchlings already this year. We continue to host interns from around the world who can work alongside the BCC staff to learn ex situ husbandry techniques. Che, who has been studying Manoria impressa in the field in Cambodia, had never witnessed their territorial combat rituals nor had he witnessed their courtship and mating and unique nest building behaviors, which he observed at the center. We have recently added Peter Prashag to our team, who will take on the role as the center's curator and head field biologist. I've been here for a month now and I'm busy with health assessments and uh, to collect some data of the tortoise species uh, which are kept on this property. And I really see a, a very big potential also to expand this collection, maybe to have a few more critically endangered species, tortoises and turtle species. And I think in um, cooperation we really can contribute to, to conservation work in and ex situ, and that's what I'm really interested in. We recognize the necessity to continue managing assurance colonies of those species whose last remaining populations are under serious pressure in the wild. But undoubtedly the most important role that we can play is to contribute to turtle conservation in the field. We continue to focus our efforts on three in situ conservation projects in the wild. One with our native pond turtle, where we will be reintroducing turtles onto a conservation easement which no longer holds a viable population. We will be conducting controlled studies on this site from temperature dependent sex determination to other aspects of their biology. The second project that we have focused on is a collaboration between the Baylor Chilolian Center, the Andy Sabin Family Foundation, and Josiah and Valer Austin, with additional support from the Desert Tortoise Council. This project involves the purchase of a large parcel of land in central Mexico which holds one of the last remaining populations of the balsam tortoise. Miles Traphagen has taken the lead on facilitating this acquisition, which is expected to take two to three years to finalize. There's a property that we're looking at. It's about 18,000 acres, and it could contain as much as 25 to 50 percent of the entire population of balsam tortoises. Surveys I've done over the last couple of years, we've estimated this population to be about 1,500 on the Ejido. In 1983, David Morofka and Bruce Burry said that no more than 10,000 balsam tortoises exist in the entire range of the species. So at this point, we're basically, we're putting the science aside because the number one thing that we need to do is to secure this land. And finally, our third commitment in the field is the urgent initiative to save one of the most endangered tortoises in the world, the plowshare tortoise, or Angonook, which was our primary motivation for attending the IUCN red listing workshop 
focusing on Madagascar's turtles and tortoises this past January. Making this our second trip in less than seven months to understand how we could contribute to the conservation of this species. The island of Madagascar is a thousand miles long. People often don't realize it's as big as that. It is in fact a mini continent, just not, not just a little island. And it's also a continent that had the remarkable situation of being essentially undiscovered by human beings until about 1500 years ago. A, a fauna developed during those millions of years of isolation from human contact that took on a sort of Alice in Wonderland quality of bizarre things, of uh, lemurs as big as bears, of the biggest bird that ever lived, that laid the biggest eggs that have ever been seen. Uh, there was an extraordinary fauna. Now we have lost practically all of the big fauna of Madagascar. And the, the fight now is to save the small and medium-sized animals of Madagascar. These include lots of things like lemurs, and they also include things like tortoises. Now the huge Galapagos-sized tortoise of Madagascar is gone. After more than 20 hours of travel and a layover in Paris, we finally arrived on the following morning at our destination, the capital city of Antanarivo. Still jet-lagged and weary, we collected ourselves at 7 a.m. for a gathering of our co-specialists on the first day of what would become four very long days of intensive workshops. The question really is, why have we come to, to Madagascar? The turtles and tortoises here uh, are, are very special. They, they occur here and nowhere else are endemic to, to this place. Uh, it's really one of the, the hot spots of uh, uh, turtle diversity in the world and, and also in terms of, of threats. Um, and the last time that we assessed the, the threatened status and, and the extinction risk uh, of Madagascar turtles and tortoises was back in 1996. And, and we do that under the auspices of the IUCN, and that's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature that oversees the so-called Red List. And the Red List is really the global standard for, for how you classify how endangered a species is. We've become aware over the last decade, 12 years or so, that uh, in fact the turtles and tortoises of Madagascar seem to be um, facing a whole lot of new threats and the risk for their extinction has increased but we need data to, to make those decisions in a scientific and objective way so what we did here is we pulled together about 80 specialists uh, uh, from around the world and from all over Madagascar representing uh, experts from uh, the uh, specialist group which which I chair uh, which is a, a, a global group of, of uh, turtle experts uh, whose mission in life whose job it is in life if you will uh, is to assess uh, uh, extinction risk in, uh, uh, for turtles all over the world so we come to, to Madagascar and we're bringing all the people in Madagascar together who work on turtles here uh, to have a conference, to have a workshop, to talk about and discuss and share uh, data on the survival status of these uh, turtles and tortoises and to determine really what the risks they face are and whether those risks have increased over the last uh, 10 uh, to 12 years. We spent the first two days evaluating the current threats and risks impacting these species. Well, the radiated tortoise is the longest lived animal in the world, and there are a couple of records of animals over 150 years old. So to sacrifice such a thing for tonight's meal is a tragedy indeed. We found a dump near Tulia, which is the main city in the south, of, of 400 plus shells. Now, we were informed that what was happening was there was a, there was a business person in Tulia who was slicing all those tortoises up, freezing the meat and then the meat was being sent out frozen by ship to places like Reunion for, for, you know, for food markets. It was interesting to go back to areas that we had seen and visited in 1991 and 1994 when there were fairly robust uh, radiated tortoise populations and to visit them today and, and to see that those populations had just literally vanished. Uh, Fifteen years ago there's places that we visited that after 4.30 in the afternoon you could stand and look up the road and just see tortoise after tortoise after tortoise and now 
those areas have been completely decimated by, by collectors. These animals are so beautiful that they fetch huge prices on the international pet trade. So that is a difficult one. It, if it were rarer and more isolated, it might actually be easier to know what to do. But to try to maintain it throughout its entire range requires extensive interaction with the local people. The other two tortoises are tiny but also beautiful. One is the spider tortoise, which overlaps in range with the radiated tortoise. It's not greatly sought after for food because of its size, but it's again very popular in international pet trade. And a few years ago, Madagascar relaxed its ban on export of these things, and thousands of them were sent to Europe and the United States. Uh, it'll take a, a long time to catch up on the population loss that was incurred in those years. And we found evidence, not on this trip, but on previous trips, uh, of uh, these animals being slaughtered in the wild, uh, holes punched in their shells, uh, and their livers ripped from their bodies in order to uh, satisfy some people's craving for fresh tortoise liver. The flat-tailed tortoise is experiencing extreme pressure from the deforestation of its small and highly specialized range. Slash and burn agriculture, charcoal production and timber are largely responsible. In the recent past, the pet trade has taken a huge toll on this species. It's now been uplisted to CITES Appendix 1, so there is no, there is no longer any legal exportation of these animals. How, the many, how many do you think you went out in the pet trade? In, in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Uh -huh. if not maybe even thousands. During two, the year 2000-2001, huge numbers went out, legally, mm -hmm. and it seriously damaged the, the wild populations. Aremnochelis madagascarensis is being heavily impacted for local consumption and being sold as souvenirs in Antanarivo as well. I've not seen these in the markets before. This is from an Aremnichiles, too big for a Pelusio, so an Aremnichiles, which of course is critically endangered. It's the first time actually I've ever seen those like that in the markets. And how much is that selling for here? Well, the opening price is about 20 US dollars. That means you could probably get it for 10. Unfortunately, we came across many more Aremnichiles shells in the tourist marketplaces. The Angonoka, or plowshare tortoise, is one of the most endangered animals in the world. These animals number only a very few hundred and they're only found in the area of Capsada and Swalala in northwestern Madagascar. And this is a remote area. The tortoises have been very stressed over the years by habitat destruction, by uh, introduced pigs and by human capture. Today of course we all know about the uh, poaching and illegal smuggling and trafficking in Inifera and uh, there's a great concern that the wild population cannot be sustained with the current levels. Uh, now with the internet, cell phones, international communication, uh, and the globalization of the wildlife trade, um, the Enifera has really been hit uh, significantly. And it's a very difficult problem because the people living in the area are extremely poor. Um, and uh, it's hard to imagine anybody leaving uh, gold bricks laying around on the ground and told not to bother them uh, when you're extremely poor. The Anganuk could disappear in the next few years if uh, some of the trade pressures continue. There's only a few hundred left in the wild. After thoroughly reviewing their threats, we now had to find solutions for their survival. So we held, had this workshop uh, here and, and uh, uh, we talked about it, we shared data, and in fact uh, we realized and we come to the conclusion uh, that uh, the, the five species of tortoises uh, and freshwater turtles that occur only in Madagascar are in fact a lot more threatened than we had expected. In fact, all five of them are now uh, considered to be critically endangered, which is the highest possible uh, listing category for the kind of threats that these animals uh, face. But we didn't want to just decide how threatened they are. We also wanted to figure out what we can do about it. We broke up into separate groups, with each group of specialists focusing on the species they had the most interest and expertise with. Eric and Maurice joined the team working on the Plowshare Action Plan, including Rick Hudson, Ed Lewis, Gerald Kukling, Richard Lewis, Anne Gap representatives, and two of the leading authorities on the species in the field, Laura Smith and Miguel Padrono. The recent dramatic decline in the populations of this species 
was the key reason we were back in Madagascar in less than a year. We were here to help draft the action plan and to continue the Baylor Center's discussions with Richard Lewis and Durrell on how we could support their ongoing efforts with this species. Well, the, the, the UNIFRA action plan is, is uh, it needs a lot of, it needs a lot of support. I mean, you've got two major components. You've got protection of the wild population, uh, which really, it, it needs some major work. The infrastructure is simply not there. They lack boats, they lack roads, they lack a communication network, and they lack, a, lack field stations. Uh, the fact that the wild population now is so vulnerable um, really throws a greater emphasis, emphasis on the, the captive population. This gene pool is just too vulnerable to, to, to keep all the eggs in one basket. We've got to spread those animals out. Angbanook tortoises are, are confiscated in Madagascar. There is really not a coherent strategy for how those tortoises are placed. They should be going into a captive program. Many times they're not. They end up at, at the croc farm or end up at, um, in, private, in private hands instead of going into a conservation breeding facility. Just met once guys having them, wanting to sell them, but they say they're not interested and cannot find people who are interested. Yeah, because I know that's for me. How many did they have for sale? Oh, they have couples, six, seven, oh. small, very small ones. Yeah. Amazingly, off camera, our guide offered us young unifera for sale. Even in the local paper, we read of a large confiscation of tortoises that included unifera that had been taken from Nigerian poachers. What we saw in sheer numbers of recently confiscated tortoises was a sobering reality of what was taking place at the very same time that we were trying to pen an action plan to save them. Originally there were 75 uh, unifera uh, stolen from, from the uh, Ampagero uh, facility uh, run by Durrell. Um, we don't know what happened to most of those animals. They were all juveniles except for, I believe, two, two large females. Uh, we never, we never got a handle on what became of the females. Only 33 ended up in the Netherlands, and those were the animals that were were shipped to us. Eventually, we did return them to to Madagascar as ordered, um, but not until John decided that they really needed to be permanently marked so that they wouldn't be marketable again. Uh, we we learned that they were going to go back to Olaf Pronk. It was a notorious animal dealer and, uh, and figured they would probably end up on the pet market. So uh, John, before shipping them out, marked each one with uh, what we deemed to be the most permanent uh, marking system we could think of at the time, and that was to, with a Dremel tool, to grind the initials of uh, the Ministry, Ministry of OA4A into one of their vertebral scoots. Uh, carefully but as deeply as possible without, without uh, hitting bone. What John Baylor did 10 years earlier was possibly one of the best deterrents against poaching, a method we are willing to use today and not dissimilar to the concept of cutting off a rhino's horn. New approaches are being uh, considered. One, for example, is the, what I like to call defacing the tortoise, which is basically branding them in such a way that uh, it diminishes their value in the illegal trade. This is not an easy uh, decision because these animals are so beautiful, uh, but uh, we're at a point now, I think, uh, where the population, uh, wild population, is down to just a few hundred animals, if that, and uh, some drastic steps are going to have to be taken. The problems faced with trying to save this tortoise are not dissimilar to the drug trade. You have a very poor country with people abroad willing to pay just about anything for them. So here we were addressing all of the symptoms with temporary solutions which were all important steps to protect them for the short term, adding guards and guard stations, new boats, communication systems, microchips and branding methods, and stricter trade enforcement, to name a few. But the 800-pound gorilla in the room was not completely addressed. How do we stop the demand that is fueling collectors to pay almost anything for this species? Until we successfully address this core issue, the protection of this species in the wild is bleak. And where will all of the funding come from to implement these measures in the years to come? Uh, there are also controversial discussions about bringing the animal into commercial trade at some point through captive breeding, again to try to diminish the uh, smuggling of wild animals. This is controversial because the minute you get an, a uh, commercial trade in an animal, you're never sure whether that's going to increase demand or decrease demand. So it's complicated, but uh, I think everybody agrees now we're at a point where we have to look at virtually all 
uh, considerations in how this species can be uh, can be uh, saved uh, because it's very close to extinction. Yet another option to consider was to lease animals from the government, similar to what Brazil has done with the golden lion tamarind, to both set up an ex situ breeding program and send funds back to Madagascar for in situ conservation. Currently, only the poachers are profiting, while Madagascar is losing yet another valuable part of its natural heritage, a flagship species, which along with the lemurs, appears on their currency, and which may be the last place where we will see them. At the close of the workshop, the action plans were presented, and the Unifera initiatives were announced by Laura Smith and Miguel Pedrono. The BCC and the TSA formally committed funds, which were earmarked for urgent Unifera conservation measures. What we all did over the last four days in drafting the action plans was an important first step, but this would be the easy part compared with implementing these initiatives, the funding, manpower, long-term supervision and commitment that would be necessary going forward. The next leg of our trip was highly anticipated. We were privileged to travel into the field with some of the world's leading authorities on the turtles and tortoises of Madagascar. Madagascar is without a doubt one of my favorite places on the planet. It's the most important biodiversity hotspot. This trip is very special because most of the time I'm out there looking at lemurs, but this time I was able to focus on the turtles and tortoises and see in the wild the last two species that I had not yet seen, the flat-tailed turtles, or capidulu, and the incredible uh, anganuk, or uh, plowshare tortoise, which is arguably the most endangered tortoise on the planet. You could look down from the plain and see why they say Madagascar is bleeding. Erosion from massive deforestation has turned the rivers red, Sugarcane fields have sprouted where tropical dry forests once stood, further encroaching on the last remaining tiny range of the flat-tailed tortoise. Arriving just north of Morondava in the Manabi region, we were granted access to the town's cemetery, which effectively acts as a tiny reserve for the tortoises, since it is completely off limits to the townspeople. In order to enter, we had to go through an extensive cleansing ceremony, which required a bottle of rum. Just tell me it's not poisonous. There's not. No, nothing. It seemed like the serpent and lizard gods were omnipresent, but not the tortoise gods. The only turtle sighting was a Pelomedusa subrufa walking along the forest floor, which quickly hid under leaf litter as we approached. He's got you surrounded, Snakey. Oh, they do a great cobra spread, don't they? They must think we're crazy tourists. <laughs> we are. After Eric and Peter Paul were pursued and stung by angry wasps, we abandoned our search and headed out to the Karindi Forest Reserve, hoping for better luck. En route, we passed Baobob Alley, which has become one of Madagascar's tourist destinations. On the road to the Karindi forest, we dodged countless snakes, lizards and chameleons. Eric couldn't resist quickly catching the first of many hogmoth snakes he got, he got. that he encountered. Good job, Eric. Nice. He was hot. Morris's keen eyes spotted Pelamedusa the size of a quarter in the puddles as we drove along the road. No 
What do you got there, Russ? Oh, I've got six cute little baby Pelamedusa. Hard to imagine anything cuter than baby turtles. Yeah, that's, that's what I got Especially side neck turtles. Look at them. They're all the same the size. <laughs> and one of them bit me several times. So it wasn't just any puddle anywhere. Ready to let them go? Sure. Here? We rescued those we could find and released them into a swamp off the side of the road. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Oh. A few minutes later, we removed this chameleon from danger also. After arriving at the reserve, we paid our respects to the guardians of the camp. The next morning we awoke to a forest rejuvenated from a night of rain, alive with the sounds of lemurs, birds and insects. The rain was a good sign to increase our chances of finding this elusive creature, the flat-tailed tortoise. An hour into our search, Eric found the first tortoise, and we ultimately found four more, some covered with moss on their shells. Paul, there's one there. Is that a mark? It looks like it. Those marks are too small. They can be hard to interpret. We collected valuable data on the biology and habitat of this little-known species, which has an extremely short active season of just three to four months, spending the remainder of the year in estivation. Oh, that is correct. Mm -hmm. So this is an unnotched specimen from the Karindi with a missing marginal scoop back here that might have been gnawed on by maybe a Fusa or Richard. Pigs. Ah, or maybe pigs, Richard Lewis suggests. So this one was found right here. This is a female and possibly eating this fruit. It looked like it was okay. See the fruit? eating this fruit. Mm. This is my first wild caught planticata. Very excited. Here in the Corindi Forest. Let me see if she's gravid. Probably not. It's not the time they lay eggs, right? They've already laid. She's not gravid. Beautiful female. There you go. Right here, we found her right here along a trail. Very humid. It's about 85% humidity. Having been here seven months earlier in the dry season, the contrast was remarkable. We picked a large and memorable baobab tree as a location for our temperature and humidity sensors. We will return in a year to collect this valuable data. Really beautiful. Yeah, really just such a nice, robust lizard. Upon departing the Corindi, iguanids were laying their eggs everywhere, which became a smorgasbord for the awaiting voracious hognose snake. Pretty serious predation. Think about it. I mean, you've got snakes all over the place. Yep. 
Yeah. And these lizards must be losing most of their eggs to, to snakes. Yeah, you're done. That was it. That was lunch. Thank you. <laughs> I think the uh, I think the lizards are going to go extinct. As we left the Karindi, we gave thanks to the guardians for our good fortune. The next day we headed north to the tiny range of the Angonoka with hopes of seeing some of the last remaining animals in the wild. The boat traffic associated with shrimp farming in this bay has increased the potential and access for poaching. There are only five remaining populations of Angonoka in the wild, one of which is located on the tiny peninsula of Cape Sarda, one of the most vulnerable populations to poachers. We just landed in Sualal, and you can see that this airport is barely used. The runway is overgrown, and we're about to head out to Cape Sada to look for some Astrocelles unifera. You know, things get can get rough here, you know, weather-wise, yeah. sea-wise. Depending on whether we see the Anganut today or not, then if, in a perfect world, we see the Anganut, then tomorrow we can go around to to here, to Lao Town, and then taking the boat to Capsada. And, and then, then this evening, back across to Bali village, and then into the, to the, our campsite here. The only boat available to us was inadequate to patrol for poaching or to monitor tortoises in the field. And, oh, and the UK as well. This is where Laura Smith did her work on Unifera in Cape Sada. The station has now fallen into disrepair. Here we are in the wet season middle of January, the rainiest month at Capsada, and you have precious water. But in a few months, this will be as dry as a bone. Eric found the first evidence that tortoises were in the area. We have found the world's rarest tortoise in the wild, one of 40 animals in this population. <laughs> this is probably the rarest tortoise on earth and right now it's very, very heavily threatened by Poaching. This animal fetches a very high price in Asia and there's a great risk of the entire remaining population being poached out if we don't take the measures that are necessary to ensure its survival, which I think really means beefing up the protection here far beyond what's uh, currently in place and having a permanent research presence here so that people can be monitoring these animals 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I think that's the kind of measures you need for critically endangered species, whatever they might be, tortoises, primates, big cats, anything. But this one in particular, because the habitat is so, so limited, it's so tiny. When we flew over it today, it was just amazing to see how little habitat remains for this animal. And uh, it's critically important and it's entirely feasible to protect this entire remaining population. It's just a matter of getting the, the funding in place to do it at the scale that's necessary and that this wonderful animal deserves.
What do you got there? It's a beautiful male here in Cape Sada. We found an adult male, adult female, and Maurice found one, unbelievably found one hatchling, uh, still showing the umbilical on the plastron. So they're obviously reproducing here, and uh, I guess the pigs didn't get that one. So I'm gonna let this guy go. As I was hiking, I saw this little guy on the side of a trail. He was flipped over on his back and gently nudged him over and he soon, soon started to feed again. Um, cute little guy. Gosh, we've come here up to Bali Bay to see the last populations uh, of the Anganuk. No more than maybe 100 animals left in the wild. Uh, and to be here in the wild and to find this animal here in this special place is a wonderful way to end our workshop uh, where we have focused on all the turtles and tortoises in Madagascar and what we can do for them. On leaving Cape Sada, we were grateful for having found both adults and a hatchling in the wild. <laughs> what sounded like an invasion of wild pigs overnight was just the snoring from our weary team. And the next morning, our stomach problems had finally subsided, thanks to the collective pharmacy we were carrying. We headed out for the last species we were looking for, Arimnocheles madagascarensis. The boat was acting up and the video camera failed. Fortunately, we still had our still camera to document the rest of the trip. And after the boat was repaired, we headed to Lake Sariaka. Despite reports of crocodiles in the lake, Gerald and Peter Paul enthusiastically snorkeled for turtles, but came up empty-handed. The only turtle caught was hooked by a local fisherman as we turned the bend. The lake appeared to support a healthy population of turtles. It was unclear if these turtles were part of the local villagers' diet, as is the case elsewhere. Some of us returned to camp by boat, while others opted to hike the 10 miles to camp in temperatures exceeding 100 degrees with very little water. In addition to turtles, the park supported a high biodiversity. Lemurs, tenrex, and chameleons were abundant, making the walk worthwhile despite the conditions. The last stop was to visit Durrell's reintroduction site, where 45 captive raised plowshare tortoises have been released since 2005. All are equipped with radio transmitters, and so far the survival rate has been promising. Our last mission was to install data loggers to collect information on the seasonal temperature and humidity needs for this species. We left Bali Bay and the villagers knowing that the future of this tortoise, to a large degree, is in their hands and dependent upon their stewardship. Our expertise can only go so far. Without the community's support and recognition of the value of their natural heritage, none of this can be possible. En route back, the video camera began working again as we flew over Lake Sariata. Back in Antanarivo, we had a few hours to kill before our flight, so we stopped at the tourist market for some last-minute shopping. It was clear that the wildlife trade was alive and well, 
and despite international laws not just hidden in the back alleys. These markets were openly selling everything, endangered Madagascan ground boas. Snake charmer from California. It's a... Uh, critically endangered radiated tortoises, numerous Ceremnochelis madagascarensis, and countless green sea turtles. Again, these are protected under Madagascar law, but um, he's saying 600,000 is the opening price, which is $300. But again, you'll be able to bring that down. We can only hope that continued pressure from conservation groups will influence the government causing them to take the pillaging of their wildlife more seriously. Back in the States, we hosted both the Turtle Conservation Fund and the Turtle Survival Alliance Annual Steering Committee meetings in New York City. And we continued to follow up to co-author a finalized Unifora action plan. But we seem to have lost some of the momentum that had been created in Madagascar. Madagascar's government is, is, is poor and, and they don't have a lot of resources and so they're, they're going to depend on the, um, the goodwill of, of conservation NGOs to, to really make this, to, to really save the turtles. And I think we have a narrow window of time to, to make that point. The, the government is, is going to change over here in several months. I think we really, we have their attention now. We, we have to capitalize fairly quickly um, and, 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 and hit the ground running. Now, eight months later, the action plan is still stalled, and nothing has been done on the ground to further protect the wild tortoises. Yet unifera smuggling has visibly accelerated since last January, with animals turning up more frequently and openly in the black markets of China and Southeast Asia. Torsten Blank's PowerPoint presentation of unifera smuggling illustrates the volume of tortoises for sale on the internet, and even shows a Chinese dealer holding a unifera in Bally Bay at Durrell's protected release site, showing just how brazen the collectors are, but also just how vulnerable this last wild population is to poaching. Clearly, we need to do more to strengthen and better enforce our international treaties and laws in the worldwide animal trade. We can only hope that our efforts this past January in Madagascar will actually translate into action. The Angonoka, along with the radiated tortoise, are two of the longest lived animals on the planet and have lived and survived for tens of thousands of years untouched by man. But in this last decade, in its last hour, unless we act now, this magnificent living relic of our past will go the way of the dodo.